Hi everyone, John Liebman here. You're watching the number one site for learning bass online for bassplayersonly.com, where I've taken all the frustration out of learning bass so you could build confidence, have fun, and just enjoy making music. It's not for everyone. It's for bassplayersonly.com. We've got a really, really special guest this week. I'm so excited about this. I've been trying to get him for a while. I finally got him. Andy West is a multiple Grammy nominee, best known as the original bass player with the Dixie Dregs with Steve Morse and the guys. And he's also done all kinds of work with Mike Keneally, Vinnie Moore, Henry Kaiser, The Mistakes, and he's done some interesting non-musical stuff, too. But I like him because he is a fellow Hurricane, a University of Miami alumnus. So welcome, Andy. How you doing? I'm doing great, John. Thanks. Thanks for the intro. Well, thanks for joining me today. You've got such an interesting background. And I have to admit that before I started preparing for this interview, I had never heard of the Hampton Grease Band. Which oh, wow. Yeah, they were huge in my early life. Well, I, I I was checking them out this morning, and they're a little different. Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of it, it, music used to be uh, much more regionally oriented. You know, there were scenes in different places. I mean, it seems to be less now than than back then. But um, but in Atlanta, the Hampton Grease Band was a legendary, iconic force, really. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I mean, I could go on for a long time about them, but for those who have never heard it, you can look it up and and you'll find people um, like Jimmy Herring and Bruce Hampton, the Aquarium Rescue Unit. I mean, he Bruce Hampton of the Hampton Grease Band was kind of like the Miles Davis of Atlanta. He really, you know, brought a lot of people to the forefront, incredible musicians. Otile Burbridge played with him for many years. Really? You know, yeah, and 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 Hampton himself is was very um, just a really <laughs> interesting guy. But anyhow, this is this is kind of a divergence, I would say. Please look him up if you're interested in not in you know odd historical music and and all the musicians that are in that tree are usually fantastic. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I, I grew up outside Detroit, and for the longest time, Bob Seger was only known to us around here before he uh, hit a yeah. national, international scene. I mentioned Maynard Ferguson once to my mother, who grew up in Canada. She says, Maynard Ferguson? She said she, she lived in someplace near Crystal Beach, which is somewhere in Ontario. She said he had a, a dance band there or something. She said he was nothing. <laughs> he was just like a local guy, Maynard oh, Oh, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> but uh, so I, I, I want to talk to you about some of the really cool stuff you're doing now. But I, I'd like to go back, if you don't mind, to the early days. You mentioned you're sure. from Georgia. Tell me about your musical upbringing. Did you come from a musical family, parents, records playing, brothers and sisters? You know, what were you initially exposed to musically? <sighs> You know, it's it's a it's a typical tale in a way. Um, didn't have any music in my family. Uh, my I have a younger brother and a younger sister. And when we were probably, I don't know, five years old or something. This is pre Beatles. We um, carved out some fake guitars and had a little group called the copycats and we would stand there and kind of sing and stuff. But I didn't actually really learn how to play anything until the Beatles, really, the Beatles were the trigger, um, co combined with the Ventures. <laughs> so I discovered the Ventures and the Beatles roughly around the same time. And, um, you know, I had a paper route and all my money went to buying Ventures albums. I had, you know, 20 plus Ventures albums. So that that kind of put me on the instrumental curve, if you will. Um, high school, all that kind of stuff, played in bands, it was typical influences, Cream, Led Zeppelin, you know, Jefferson Airplane, all the heavy stuff of that era. I mean, I'm going to be 70 in, you know, a handful of months here. So this is like the late 60s type of thing. Um, 1970, I moved to Augusta, Georgia, and that's where I met Steve Morse. And so we just started, I mean, there's a there's a story there too, but we, we started hanging out and kind of playing in bands together and um, started writing our own music. I mean, Steve was early on trying to, you know, contrive of songs and these kinds of things. And we would just do endless jams and all that stuff. And it was in high school that you met Steve? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. And uh, the, the, you know, <laughs> he was from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I don't know if you know that. I, I He was born in Ohio and he lived in a few places. And then I yeah. think his family settled in Georgia. So That's right. When, when I met him, they had moved from Ann Arbor to Augusta, you know, probably a handful of years before that. And, um, you know, so we were always, we weren't really Southerners, if you will. Um, I was, I was born in Newport, Rhode Island. And then I lived up Northeast most of my life until I was 12 when I moved to Atlanta and then, uh, moved to Augusta when I was 16. Um, so this, I mean, the South is a really fascinating place. I love it. It's very complicated, um, kind of culturally, you know, uh, but there, there's just a lot of great people there. And, uh, you know, I, I I love my childhood and growing into adulthood there. Although the first time I ever came to California, which was in 1976, it was one of those literally this blows my mind kind of things. <laughs> what, what part of California? Southern California, Los Angeles, and then you know took some trips up the coast. And uh, I, th- yeah, I thought you were going to say San Francisco, and that. Uh, no, well, you know, I I did end up there after the dregs broke up the first time in 1983. I lit- I moved to Marin County, and uh, because I love California, I love the West Coast so much, and I've been out here ever since. Really, with a with a brief stint in Chicago for two years, um, which ex- you know. I love Chicago, great people, great restaurants. The music scene at that time was Ministry and KMFDM, and I loved all those bands, you know, and uh, but but no no mountains. <laughs> uh, no, they got a big lake, though. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Well, going back, you, you mentioned in the, the early days, you said Cream, you said Led Zeppelin, somebody yeah. else. But uh, so how did you become a bass player? Can I assume that, that Jack Bruce and John Paul yeah. Jones were among your influences? Absolutely. I mean, I love Jack Bruce ever, you know, forever. Um, and I saw Cream play in Atlanta at Chastain Park when I was 16 or it was like 1968. So I was 15, I think. Yeah. I think oh, my mom wow, brought me yeah. off at the show. What a great yeah. time to see them. Oh my God. Yeah. It was incredible. Um, they I were, saw, their- I saw Jack at a, a NAM show probably 10, 15 years ago. I, I was telling my brother, I said, he came out. I said, Jack Bruce. And he came out and he played uh, sunshine of your love. I said, yeah. that is a once in a lifetime, you know, for me, it, was. it is. Well, I mean, but you know, he, he was one of a kind really. I mean, his vocal, You know, his vocal ability combined. I mean, he's like a McCartney kind of thing, you know, I mean, as a singer, he would play vocal like bass lines, you know, that were just incredible. And so, you know, I, I, I mean, I can't. Those were my influences in the sense of I love that music, you know. Okay, so did you become a bass player because of those guys or did you discover those guys because you were already yeah, player. I discovered those guys. I mean, I started playing guitar, I think, uh, I, you know, when I was like 11. And um, then, you know, we found some guys to start trying to have a band, you know, after I knew how to play a few notes, you know, no music schooling or anything at that point. Um, and we didn't have a bass player. And I think two strings broke off my guitar and I tried <laughs> bass. And then it was like, oh, let me get a bass, you know. <laughs> That's funny. So, yeah. All right. So you and Steve were both down in Miami at the same time. Did he go there also? Yeah. Well. Well. So. So we both we got out of high school, and um, Steve is a, um, a year younger than I am, and I, I kind of got out of high school early as well. And we had bands through high school. Then when he graduated from high school, he decided he wanted to pursue classical guitar. Uh-huh. At the University of Miami, there was a great teacher there. And do you he, remember his name? The teacher, yeah, one, one, uh, Mercadello or something. Yes, yes, I know who you mean. Okay, I forget his last name, honestly. This is weird. Yeah, well, anyhow, m- maybe it'll come to me. But, um, but Steve went to U of M and I stayed around. I went to uh, University of Georgia in Atlanta and we still communicated like by literally mail. <laughs> yeah, there's no no Facebook or texting in those days. <laughs> yeah, and that's where he met Rod and Alan, the drummer and violinist that ultimately became in the band. And um, you know, Steve came back to Augusta for a year to go to college, 
And while we were there together, he was like, we got to go down to Miami. There's such incredible musicians there. And so I got into the U of M at that point and we both went down there and, um, I was, I had actually, in the meantime, I'd kind of learned how to play cello. And so I was studying cello in, in college. Um, but I, 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 it, it, it didn't stick. I mean, I, I worked really hard at it and I could kind of saw away at it, but, um, but you know, the bass was my thing really. So when you guys were down in Miami, I was trying to figure out that, that generation of, was that when, when Mark Egan and Will Lee yeah. and, 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 Danny Gottlieb was Jocko there at that time. He was yeah, there like yeah, for a minute, yeah. I think yeah. a semester or something. No, it was crazy. I mean, the level of talent was astonishing, you know. Um, and Jocko was playing in these little clubs around town, and this yeah. this guy took me to see him, and and so we we knew all those guys. Pat Metheny, you know, he was like twenty, <laughs> yeah. you know, and and um, then you know his first gig out of college was with Gary Burton. You know, and and so they were it, it was a weird time. I mean, it was really kind of incredible Um the the uh, there was just a lot of energy around. It. You know, Miami at that time was on the tail end of the old days. You know, it was kind of decrepit, actually. And but there were gigs there. There were guys in, in school who would play at places like the Fountain Blue, you know, and they'd go in and they yeah. play old was, tunes for old me. people. You know, that was me. Yeah. I yeah. Used to and play they with might, oh, yeah. Well, you went to U of M, you said, you know, so you know about it. OK. Yeah. Uh, I played um, with Patty Andrews from the Andrews Sisters and and Jerry yeah. Dale and, and Donald O'Connor and Eddie Fisher and uh, yeah, the Ink exactly. Spots. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Was, so, uh, you know, and then, I mean, you go there now and it's like, you know, <laughs> it's mind blowing. Um, you, you know, I kind of don't want to be there now. You know, it's 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 culturally a very weird thing to me. But um you know, the whole, it's just, I don't know. I, I won't go off on it, but Miami, it's an incredible place, incredible energy, Coral Gables, you know, where the U of M was or is, it is. Yeah. Um, you know, had, a, I had a lot of interesting experience there. Well, anyhow, Steve and Rod, um, we're going to, and Alan, we're all going to graduate U of M at roughly the same time. Alan and Steve graduated at the same time. And then Rod was going to graduate three months later. So when Alan and Steve graduated, we all decided that we would have a band and we'd move back to Augusta and start there. And so Rod was, um, he had three more months to go in his you know, college. And so we had another drummer who joined us from Miami and for three months and who played with us. God, I forgot his name. This is embarrassing. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I can see his face and everything. Uh, but but what's really interesting about that is we asked Danny Gottlieb if he would do it because Danny was graduating and Danny was like, oh, man, I, you know, I'd really love to do it. But I got this gig with, you know, somebody like Bobby Rydell or some, you know, somebody old like that, you know, but yeah. he had a gig, you know, a paying gig. And we were like, yeah, we're going to we're, we're going to make it, man, you know, <laughs> but we don't have any gigs, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, and Danny is so he's so great. I mean, I've seen him probably once every 10 years or something. But, you know, he always mentions, yeah. man, I still regret that I didn't go play with you guys for that yeah. summer. You know, and it's kind I of imagine anybody not liking Danny Gottlieb. He's just such such a great guy. No, he's a great guy and he's a great musician, you know, yeah, really, yeah. really amazing. I, I love talking about Miami. I was down there when I was in school. It was the Miami Sound Machine guys and uh, John Sakata. He was Juan Sakata when I knew him. And Andy Timmons was down there at the oh, time. Oh, yeah. Andy's so, incredible, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. We, we keep mean, in touch also. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I met him probably 10 years ago through Mike Keneally, I think. And, um, you know, we, we just hit it off. I mean, I, I, I haven't talked to him for a number of years, but, but he's one of those guys I just feel super comfortable with. And his musicianship is just incredible, you know, yeah. and yeah. he talks about it. And did you, did you, was Randall Dollahan the teacher there? Yes. Oh yeah. The guitar yeah. teacher. Yeah. yeah. Randall played with us too. Really? Yeah. He was in the band when we didn't have a key. We had two guitars and violin and drums in me. Wow. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. Steve Bailey was down there when I was there. Was uh, yeah, Steve was after after us. Yeah. yeah, he's another incredible player. I mean, oh yeah. Well, he's just an incredible human, and you know, a force of nature in his own right. Yeah. 
Well, so we could go on and on about these guys for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's a, that's a, in a nutshell what what happened. And then we started off, and we took about two and a half years before we landed a record deal. I mean, we played all over the South in dives and you know everywhere we could. Yeah, I've gotten to know Dave Larue pretty well. I've interviewed him a few times. Do you guys have a relationship? Well, uh, well, I mean, of course I know Dave and I've talked to him, but I haven't talked to him in, in several years. I mean, he's, you know, he's incredible. Oh, and, yeah. um, you know, this whole Steve Morris band. And then when I wasn't in the dregs and he was playing, I mean, he's, and then this whole thing with John Petrucci. I mean, you know, yeah. it's like Dave is just, you know, there's a lot there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I really like the stuff that you're doing now. And I imagine you'd, you'd want to share some of that, but uh, I've, I've been listening. You, you sent me some links ahead of time and I checked out some of your music and uh, Zen walk with Craig Pallet and, and some other stuff. So tell me what's keeping you busy these days, Andy. Well, uh, yeah. So Zen walk is what it, is an interesting project. I'll, I'll say is, although we haven't done anything with it for a couple of years, but a, a, a dear friend of mine, Craig Pallet, who's an incredible composer and um, he's a trumpet player, although he doesn't play trumpet very much anymore, I, I think. Um, and just a writer. And, and uh, we just did this whole thing remotely. You know, we did a five song EP it's on Bandcamp, um, And, it's very synth, you know, its roots are in tangerine dream combined with something else. <laughs> okay. You know, tangerine dream was, was really, again, another kind of groundbreaking type of group, but the music we do, you can hear that in there, but it's, there's more chordal kind of things going on and stuff. And, and with, with Craig, what he does is basically he would, he would have songs pretty well done and then he would give me all the MIDI files and I would I would start ripping stuff out and putting stuff in and then playing my own bass lines, you know. So I'd write all the bass parts and sequences and stuff. And it was really great. I mean, I love that kind of music. I love working with synthesizers and, you know, a computer. And, and so that's one whole thing. There's um, an art to playing a, a busy bass line without getting in the way of the other stuff, which I really enjoyed about uh, listening to those recordings. Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I mean, my schooling, if you will, comes from the dregs, you know, almost all of those songs had composed bass parts, you know, and so they were, they fit in the song, you know, it's like a very fitting kind of notion. Everything in those songs is keyed together, you know, and, um, and I love that. I mean, I love Steve's compositions and I would never, you know, compare anything I do to his, but except for the fact that I do like writing a bass line, you know, and sort of performing it. Now that's completely different than sort of the improvisational stuff, you know? And so like the five times surprise, which I, I sent you a link to is also on Bandcamp and five times surprise was a thing uh, initiated by a friend of mine, Henry Kaiser, yeah. who, um, you know, I met him, I don't know, just after I moved to Marin County, like 84, I was in uh, Modulus Graphite, the shop. You mentioned and, Jeff Gould in an interview that, yeah. that I was listening to. I bought my graphite neck from him in 1986. Oh, that's awesome. Modulus well, Jeff, Graphite. Now, there it is right there. I'm looking at it. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have, you know, I don't know, five bases made by him. Yeah. But um, he, uh, in when I moved to San Francisco, we we had met. It was very odd how we met. Um, you know, uh, I was one of the first guys to play a Steinberger bass. You know, I called Ned Steinberger on the phone <clears throat> when I read about it in like Guitar Player magazine. And um, I said, hey, this thing looks really interesting. He says, yeah, I don't know. You know, I've got four prototypes and, and there's one left. Um, we don't know if we're going to make any more, but if you want to buy this one, you can. And so I did. And then they, they got some money and they started making these bases and, you know, it went on from there. But um, at did you NAM, know Ned I, is, did you know Ned is not a musician at all? Yeah. Not, yeah. Not even, he's into balance and art and efficiency and all that stuff. He came no, up, he says, I got this prototype. Would you play it? and Let me know what you think. I said, 
okay. And yeah. I said, why don't you change this? He says, everybody says that I'm going to make that change. Yeah. 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 No, he's, he's a designer, but he has, yeah. he, so he's very creative in that, but he doesn't play, but right. he listens to musicians. So he, I mean, Ned is another yeah. guy. I mean, I feel so lucky to have crossed paths with all these brilliant people. Yeah. Um, you know, it just happens. But, uh, but the point is that I met Jeff because I didn't know, I thought that Ned was like, you know, the graphite thing was like a brand new thing to me. And then I was at NAM and I saw Jeff's booth and I was like, Jeff, uh, you know, this graphite stuff is incredible. Do you know Ned Steinberg? He says, yeah, I know him. <laughs> and, and they, you know, at the time there was a question about, is there a patent thing going on here, you know, that needs to be resolved. And th th it, it turns out that Jeff's graphite is is very it's a particular process that's pure graphite cooked in the ovens and this kind of stuff and Ned's graphite at the time was more of a composite type of thing you know with fiberglass and different different materials in there um so they they were they were a little bit different but that's kind of how I met Jeff and then this is the long way of saying how I met Henry because I was at the Modulus store in San Francisco and Henry walks in and, and, and Jeff says, oh, this is Henry. You, you guys should meet and talk to each other. And so we did and hit it off. And, you know, we've been playing in bands off and on and projects ever since, which leads me to Five Time Surprise, um, which has Jeff Sype, Anthony Perog, and Tracy Silverman, as well as myself and Henry. Now, if you don't know any of those guys, they're all, you know, phenomenal players. And and uh, Jeff was in the Jimmy Herring band, which toured with McLaughlin on his last tour. Uh, but he also has a long history with Jonas Helborg and Sean Lane, if you know that group. Um, yeah, yeah, incredible. Jonas very well. Yeah, Jonas is a, the monster, you know. Um, I played his bass one time. It weighs like 40 pounds. It was really a Warwick uh, factory and showroom in, in Mark Neukirch in Germany. I'm like, how yeah. do you, I can't even last one tune on this. How are you going to play a whole gig? You know, I, I, I love his playing so much, though, because he, he he's a very, I, I mean, I kind of distinguish between, I mean, there's classifications, right? <laughs> Jonas is one of these improvis improvising melodic bass players i mean he obviously has all the rhythmic stuff right but but his melodies and the things that he comes up with are just really unique you know to me and it's and it's not all just percussive you know yeah. and so percussive is a whole different realm you know percussive bass playing but but the five times surprise the way we did it very different than what we did with uh, craig and myself where we started with song forms and then you know kind of compose them together in Five Times Surprise, we all went to Nashville because three of the guys were within driving distance of Nashville. Someone was willing to to give us a studio to use. And we it's just went a few of them there. <laughs> yeah. And, and we just jammed for three days. I mean, literally came in maybe some ideas, you know, really minimal sort of song forms. And um it was a blast, you know, and then out of that, Henry takes that stuff and kind of carves it into, oh, yeah, this this really is more of a song. We can cut this up, not not necessarily cut and paste things together, but chop here and chop here, call it beginning and end. And this makes a song. And um, Tracy is a six string violinist. Um, wow. it, it's funny because everyone who played had six strings. I had my six string bass, Henry had his guitar and the violin had six strings. So it's like, and, and the other guitarist who Anthony, who's another, you know, he plays, I mean, all these guys are worth looking at, you know, if, if, if people want to explore music that they haven't heard, but that I'll just leave it at that. Um, but that kind of composition I really like because with a drummer like Jeff, I, I am not the timekeeper. He is the timekeeper and I'm playing kind of over it and in it and around it. And I love that kind of playing, you know, I, I that to me is really, it's very different than the Drake's, right? It's completely improvised and um, so not functioning in the traditional role of a bass player. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I mean, I, I would definitely say, and I'll say this to anyone is like, I am definitely not a journeyman bass player. I mean, I know how to do, a couple of things <laughs> okay. well, you, you know well. and, and it's, yeah and i do and i and it's okay you know I, I i mean i know how to play bass in the dregs 
you yeah. know, and that that's pretty darn cool. Well, and I was I, talking to get back to Dave LaRue for a second. He says, Steve Morris, kind of to your point earlier, he says he wouldn't just throw a chord chart at me. His parts were all written out very much. Oh, yeah. Story. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I think you're selling yourself short, Andy. Well, OK. But well, I will tell you this. Um, you probably have, if you've listened to the dregs, you may have heard the song Refried Funky Chicken. Yeah. OK, which is like the, it's got this real fast little bass part in the middle, bass and guitar double this thing. And I remember when I was at, in in uh, Atlanta and Steve was in Miami, we we're going to meet up in Augusta. He said, oh, I wrote this song here and he sent me like this bass line. This, he said, learn this part. And I and I picked it up and I learned it. But this was, you know, we weren't sharing tapes or anything back then. Even it wasn't even cassettes yet, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was written music. And so uh, he sent me this thing, and and we got together, and he played it for me, and my jaw dropped because he played it like four times as fast as I learned it. Uh, wow. You know. And so that that, but I I always trailed him in in that. I mean, he would come up with these things that were very challenging and and really creative, and it was really fun to learn all that stuff. And you know, with, with Dave and with the Steve Morse band, he get, he definitely gave Dave a lot more freedom to 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 you know provide the underpinning, the motions, you know, if you will. But those songs all have parts too, you know, very clear, extreme parts. <laughs> You remind me of a time I, I visited Jeff Berlin's school in uh, where is it Saint Saint Petersburg or somewhere? In yeah, Florida. yeah, I was there once too. It was uh, it, yeah, it was just north of Saint Pete. Yeah, near Clearwater. I think. Yeah, Clearwater. So, okay, yeah. So his his ex wife was telling me there there are two framed manuscripts on the wall. I, I said, "What's that all about?" She says, "Oh, those are Frank Zappa charts. You'll love this story." He gave Frank Zappa gave Jeff Berlin a part to learn for a recording and Jeff just killed himself. He shredded it. He learned it. He had it down. He went into the studio. Zappa says, okay, let's go. And he start playing. And Zappa says to Jeff, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm, I'm playing the music. You gave me the music and here it is. He says, let me see that. And Zappa says, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I gave you the guitar part. No, here, here's the bass part. This is what I want you to play. <laughs> so, so they've got both of those manuscripts framed on the wall there in that school. Oh, that's cool. awesome. Yeah. For bass players only, I've got just about 800 interviews right now. One every single week since June 15th, 2009. I've never missed. That's impressive. Sometimes I've had two or even three a week because there were just so many. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I'm getting at, we're really a bass instruction site. So I've got yeah. people from all over the world coming to for bass players only every day to learn music. We've got people in just about all 50 states and about 50 countries and growing worldwide. And I noticed that more and more of them tend to be men in their 50s, 60s, 70s. A lot of times they have arthritis, tendinitis, and that I was fooling around with a, another tagline. Uh, I, you know, I say the number one site for learning bass online. I take the frustration out all the stuff that I said at the beginning and that I'll say at the end. But I'm kind of fooling around with you can learn bass despite sore muscles, creaky bones, and getting older, because that yeah. is a lot of who I am attracting and my groove grower framework, the system I have for learning bass just plays into that beautifully. We do get a fair bit of women too. It's not all men, but a lot of people of fifties, sixties, seventies. I had somebody I talked to the other day said, I'm going to be 76 in a few months. He's been with me for years. So in that context, obviously they're not setting out to to make careers in music they don't want to be rock stars they're not trying to set the world on fire they want to play some rock riffs and some blues shuffles and maybe some walking yeah exactly and stuff like that exactly. so having having it set up like that what advice do you have for somebody who wants to learn bass somebody like that well um i i think it's it's important to just play you know i i mean the the to me, it's never been that hard to figure out how to do things. In other words, some people go really extreme with like, oh, you know, your hands need to be in this position exactly. And, and you know, when I look at any number of dozens and dozens of incredible players, I will see a wide variation in approaches to the base, oh, yeah. you know. And so it's kind of like whatever works for you. But the main thing is just 
doing it, you know, <laughs> and and uh, even now my hands do hurt if I play too long. But I and I and I can't tell if it's like you know incoming arthritis or I just haven't built up my strength for these you know super fast things or whatever, um, you know. But I kind of don't worry about it because uh, it's like if something hurts, stop doing it and make sure that you put in the time. To, to learn stuff. And, and there's one other thing which I didn't have when I, I, I didn't pay attention to when I was really young. And I still feel I'm developing that. And, and that is just, you know, hearing, right? Hearing music and, um, you know, identifying chords and those kinds of things. What's cool about older people <laughs> do, approaching this is that they, they remember something often that they don't have now, you know, or they remember a feeling about music or they think about music in a particular way. And so, um, you know, this is just a long philosophical rant in a way, but, uh, but it's really, I think about just picking up your instrument and trying to play along with something. And one of the real challenges for people uh, is young or old is finding other people to play with. And now that's something that, that has kind of disappeared or or become even more difficult. But because we have these other tools, it's not like you're just on a desert island by yourself. You can still learn. You can still learn how to improvise over a four chord pattern with your computer playing the music. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which is it's that's so awesome. There are any number of directions you can go. But again, I will maintain that just putting in the time is the most important thing. Tell me about your gear. I saw a, a video clip of you. It looked like you were playing an Alembic bass. Is that your main thing or is that? Well, uh, no. So the more? bass. Okay. So um, I played Alembic from really early on. I mean, when uh, I think I got my first Alembic in 74 and it was one of these kind of things where I read about the bass just like I did with Steinberger like six years later, mm -hmm. but I read about the bass and guitar player and um, there was a dealer in Charlotte. And basically I had a $200 car and a $2,000 bass, yep. you know, because <laughs> I just, I, I played this bass and I was just like, Oh my God. So I played the Alembic for the entire time through the dregs. Um, I've had, uh, I had one bass, which was my original bass. And then I, I I think over time I've had two other Alembics. So, but then when I was in California, after, you know, realizing that I wasn't going to be, a, again, a journeyman musician, I sold those bases to, to get money. And um, one of the guys who bought the bass, my original bass, kept it like until 2018. And he had it. And um, the bass you saw me play was that bass. Basically, he he had it sort of refurbished by Alembic and, um, but he needed money too. He had some health problems. And um, I said, man, you should, you know, I will, I will verify this space and, and do what I can. You should try and sell it, you know, on eBay or something, because, you know, I'm not going to give you what you want for it. And, you know, people are crazy. So, so he sold it and a really nice guy bought it, Rob, and I forget his last name. And when, we, when this dregs tour came up, he, he emailed me and said, Hey, Andy, I have your original bass. I'm, I, you know, I'd be thrilled if, if wow. you wanted to play it, I'd loan it to you for the tour. Wow. You know? Yeah. And I said, okay, well, you know, first off, I was like, let me think about this because, um, you know, that's, that's a great thing, but I want to be careful that this works, you know? And so we worked it out and, I ended up playing it on this one song because I really was used to my six string bass at this point, but I kind of, I mean, there's a history to that bass. It was the bass that I used to record all those songs. And um, so I was really thankful that he did that. It had a completely different sound, it had the Olympic sound that was perfect for this thumb thing that I did on this one tune. And, um, but that was a one-off kind of thing. Really Jeff Gould has made all my bases for the, for the past, 20 years really and um graphite is, is yeah is, graphite that, that's his graphite thing? but you know and his thing is a his uh his thing is a graphite with a bolt-on neck yeah they sound great and i've used dmg pickup since i was using steinberger and um you know so i i have a six string uh that i had jeff make um 
Well, what's it called? Is it called a, a Gould base or what? what yeah. Kind of... Yeah. G Gould. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Jeff with a G, right. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, G Gould base and he has a logo GG and uh, you know, it, it, it's great. So that's what I use. I also, I do have a Steinberger, not the original one. I sold the original one a long time ago. Um, but uh, I have one of their Synapse bases and that is great base still has piezo pickups in it. You know, you blend them and that kind of thing. Four string. I a, yeah. I have another G G gold fretless, a five string fretless. And um, you know, Jeff and I tried to make a base with Aria, which is how I met Steve Bailey because Steve has been a six string player forever. Yeah, He found out about this bass I, I was making, which had a whammy bar on it. And yeah. it was, you know, it was crazy. And th again, this is like mid eighties type of stuff. Um, and Jeff made the neck mold for me based on how I like, I like a kind of like a the C shaped neck, you know, a real a, a kind of more. And Jeff's necks are all super thin, like front to back, you know, and they're, they're pretty flat. And I've gotten used to that too. And I have some of his things, but, but this recent, the six string that I had him make me, I had him go back to the more, the more rounded back. And I just, it feels so good to me. I love it. What kind of strings do you play? Yeah. So I've used labella strings. I had a, um, a long time ago, I bought an F bass. Have mm -hmm. you ever played those? Yeah. From uh, Hamilton, Ontario. Yeah. Uh, Marcel and George Furlanetto. Yes. Incredible basses. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I bought it at the base center in LA. Yep. When it on existed. Ventura Boulevard. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I I went in there one day and I was like, okay, I need a new, I need some inspiration. I need a new base. I'm just going to play all the bases. I'm not going to look at how much they are. I'm just going to decide yeah. which one I want. And that was the one I picked, and it was great. But it had Labella um, super steps on it. You know, with the exposed core. Uh huh. And I really fell in love with those strings and. Um, so I played those for many years. And then right about five years ago, I was at the NAM show and um, Richard Rocco at Labella said, right. well, I got these, these Co strings. Coco. Coco. Yeah, Coco. Yeah. Excuse me. Rocco was somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You see, this is how this goes. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> there's letters being replaced. You know what? But I'm, I'm, I'm accepting it all and happy with it. You know, good. you look happy. You look good. Yeah. So, so that's, that's how that goes. But, uh, but he basically said, Oh, we got these interesting strings. Maybe you want to try them. And they were these, um, you know, everyone has the tone that they like. I mean, I, I, um, mine is very MIDI. It's very pick oriented. You know, I like to be able to detect the notes. Of course, I love that big fat puffy fender sound, you know, but that's not what I do. You know, um, and these strings are uh, polished steel, so they're flat, but they're pretty bright and smooth. And um, I love them. They're Labella. I, I don't know if they still make them. They probably stopped. <laughs> you know, it's like the, for me, oh, those are great strings. Oh, they're gone. Yeah. But but you're a Labella guy. Yeah. Regardless. OK. W what about the future? Anything else coming up that we haven't already talked about? Uh, it's pretty well unknown. Um, okay. At this point in my life, it's like the only thing I could do that would have any recognition, you know, is, is the dregs. And we're probably not going to do that again because just the physicality of it all is overwhelming, you know? Um, but I still have fun with music and I still love playing. So there it is. Well, keep it up. What would you be if you weren't a bass player? Something outside of music. You know, it's funny. I, there's very few things that I think about, well, you know, maybe I could have done that. But uh, lately I've been thinking how fascinating it would be to be in sort of the study and technology of waste management. <laughs> I, I may have mentioned I have about 800 interviews. I ask everybody that question. Nobody's ever given me that answer. <laughs> cool. Well, I mean, just think how incredible it is. I, you know, it, it's like what happens and how we live in this civilization where we just, you know, stuff comes into our lives and we throw it out and it's gone. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. So, so what, what would you do with that? In well, that I don't know. I mean, you know, if, if anyone, <laughs> you can go find out, for example, 
how they manage the garbage system in Manhattan. And that alone is astonishing, right? Where from, from managing a fleet of trucks that goes and picks up trash on the side of the road, yeah. where does it go? You know, how does it, how is it handled? It gets into these massive containers and then it goes, uh, you know, onto a barge and then it goes into New Jersey somewhere. And then part of it gets separated out and goes to a, a power plant where they actually burn garbage to make power. And then, you know, on and on and on. How did you come up with this interest? It, it, I stumbled on, um, I, I don't know, some in the back. It's just an engineering thing, you know. Stumbled some, on a garbage can? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I actually read a book called Garbology. A yes, I was going to say there is a word, garbology. Yeah. That's uh, why I have a paper shredder because of garbology. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> uh, it, it was a fascinating book. I don't, uh, you know, I don't know how much it's evolved since then, but but the the story was basically it starts off, what happens to all those Christmas lights that no longer work? You know, and this was 15, 20 years ago when he, I think he wrote this. And and it traced the past. You know, okay, they go into a recycling bin. Then there's people who rip them apart. Eventually, all the copper and everything else makes its way back to China. This is a long time ago. Probably doesn't happen like this anymore. And there was there was literally a town where all of the discarded Christmas lights around the world would converge. And then they would be remade into other stuff. <laughs> Somebody's got a job that... Wow, you know that's fascinating. It is. It's crazy, um, but anyways, there you go. You are a fascinating man. <laughs> Sometimes things comes up, come things come up in these interviews that I never ever talking to Billy Sheehan and he brings up Jackie Gleason to work. I mean, who, <laughs> you know, that's not what I thought we were going to be talking about. Are all these heavy metal guys who said, "Yeah, I like Ray Brown and Jimmy Bland." Yeah, like, yeah. Whoa, you know? Well, this has been great. I really am so happy that we got together. I thank you so much. Keep doing what you're doing. And uh, boy, thanks for all those great recordings of the dregs and everything else that you've done. And we will keep an eye out for anything else that you're coming. You've got hundreds of unfinished products. So uh, yeah. uh, songs, so projects, I should have yeah, said. Yeah, exactly. So All right, I well, want to well, wrap it up here, but which tag should I use? Should I use the one about uh, how I've taken all the frustration out of playing bass or should I use the one about the sore bones and the, the, uh, the, the sore muscles and the creaky bones? <laughs> or I, I could do both of them and let the people who are watching this uh, comment below which one you like better. But first of all, do you have a, <laughs> a preference? <laughs> no, you know, um, I, 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 I appreciate the service. Um, you know, people, when they need those things, they can find them with you, which is great. Well, thank you. Well, this is the first time I've ever started with one tag and ended with another one. So here goes. <laughs> Thanks to our special guest, Andy West. I'm John Liebman. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com, where you can learn bass despite sore muscles, creaky bones, are getting older. It's not for everyone. It's for bassplayersonly.com. Not a bass player? Come on in. We'll make you a bass player. Thanks again, Andy West. Thanks to all of you for watching. I'm John Liebman. We'll see you all next week. Let's play bass.